This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Friends, welcome to worship with Shandon Presbyterian Church. Whoever you are and wherever you are, we are so grateful you have chosen to share in this time together with us. Our Sunday morning services, as you already know because you are participating in one right now, remain online. We do have a variety of outdoor activities, however, that are enabling us to gather in small and safe groups. Tonight, on October 25th, we have an outdoor prayer service being held on our church lawn. We do have to cap that attendance at 50 people, and the 5 o'clock service is full. If you have not yet registered and are thinking right now how much you wish you had registered, as of this recording, we do have some space available still at the 6 o'clock service. We will have to limit attendance there as well, but you are welcome to come by just before six o'clock and see if we still have some spaces available. We will certainly welcome you if we are able. Please know that we long for the day when we can welcome everyone at the same time, all in the same place with doors open wide. Right now, our concern for your health and safety keeps us from doing that fully, but know that our hearts are wide open to you still. Stewardship materials have gone out in the mail to our membership. I ask that you be on the lookout for those. We know that some folks are having a bit of trouble with their mail, so if yours does not arrive, give us a call in the church office and we will make sure and get another set to you. We invite you to look over all of that information carefully and prayerfully in preparation for Dedication Sunday, which is November 15th. Lastly, a reminder that next Sunday is All Saints Day, and there are some announcements in the worship bulletin and in our weekly email about events related to that day, including both a way to have names of your loved ones included in the service and an evening opportunity for lighting candles in their memory. I know that all of these announcements can sometimes feel incredibly tedious, especially when we front load them at the start of a worship service. But they are the details of how we are a community together, even in these physically apart days. And so that somehow makes these mundane details become the stuff of holiness. But let us turn our attention now to the Holy One as we begin our service of worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Where are you, God asked the man and the woman. I am searching for you, God said. Where are you? Where are you, God asked us. I am searching for you, God says. Where are you? Are we among the least and the lowly? The lost and the forsaken? Are we offering hope to the hopeless? Comfort to the grieving, faith to those who are afraid. Where are you, God asks us. We are here, O oh God, ready and eager to worship you.
If we believe our brokenness and sin is hidden from God, or if we believe we are without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us of our sin and cover us in God's righteousness. Let us confess our sins now, first together and then silently. If we have been the source of pain, O God, if to the weak we have refused our strength, if in rebellion we have strayed away, forgive us, God. Amen. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. As people born of water and the Spirit, we have died to the old life, and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Even though we are physically distanced during this time, no less important is God's call to share Christ's peace. Pass the peace now and today with those around you and with those farther afield by call or text or voicemail or FaceTime or letter or wave by so that God's peace and love may blanket the earth and light the way for those lost, hiding, and scared. Amen. Now I'd like the children to come forward for the word for children. I want you to come down close to your computer screen or your TV because today we have a baptism. And you are an important part of that baptism, boys and girls, because there will be some very important questions you're going to be asked if you will help our newest member, little Margie, as she grows up in the life of faith. And you're going to be asked some questions. And so I want you up here close and loud when it comes to your part of the service to answer yes to the questions that I'll ask you. Baptism is one of the most remarkable things we do. In baptism we proclaim you are a child of the covenant. God's promises are for you. We baptize because Jesus tells us to. Go and make disciples. He tells us, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to observe everything I have taught you. And I will be with you until the end of the age. And we baptize because we need it. In a world where life is hard, where relationships struggle, where people let us down, where we let ourselves down, we need to be reminded that God is faithful always. In that way, baptism is much more about God than it is about us. It is our baptism, though, because when we stand in front of this water, when the water washes down upon our heads and into our hearts, we are saying for ourselves or for our loved ones, I want to be a part of God's love. 
And God looks at us and says, You always have been, and you always will be. That promise is what we celebrate today. On behalf of the session of Shannon Presbyterian Church, I present Marjorie Ross Stewart, daughter of Marjorie and Charles Stewart, to receive the sacrament of baptism and be welcomed into the body of Christ, the church. Marjorie and Charles, do you understand your child Margie to be a child of God and a recipient of God's grace? Do you? We do. We do. Do you renounce evil and sin and their power in the world? And do you turn away from anything which seeks to defy God's love? We do. We do. do you turn to Jesus Christ and trust in Him as Lord and Savior? We do. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to share that faith with your child? We do. We do. Will you teach her to become Christ's faithful disciple as well, obeying his word and sharing his love? And will you bring her to church so that all of you will be surrounded and supported in your life of faith? We will. Do we, the members of Chandler Presbyterian Church, promise to share the good news of the gospel with Margie and her family? Will we welcome them, love them, and support them the way Jesus asked us to? Will we? We will. I have a few more questions, this time for the children. Do you promise to be friends with Margie? Yes. To show her around the church when she is older? Yes. If she falls down, will you help pick her up? Yes. To share your books and stories and teachers with her? To help her feel welcome and loved and cared for. Yes. Let us now confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now pray together. This water is ordinary. O oh Lord, it came straight from the tap. But in this water you make extraordinary promises. In this water you claim us as your own. In this water you wrap us up in your unending love. And in this water you remind us that we are children of the covenant. O oh God, it has always been this way with you and water. You called water out of the chaos and brought forth life. Through the flood you gave our clumsiness a graceful new beginning. Through the Red Sea you led your people to freedom and at a wedding celebration with six jars filled to the brim, you remind us, us that extravagance and abundance and joy always have a place in this world. And you yourself, O oh Lord, were baptized just like this child today. Your name was spoken, the waters washed over you, and God called you beloved. So pour out your Spirit upon this water and upon us. Give these children faith as they follow you, joy as they serve you, wisdom as they learn from you, and love as they tell about you. And give all of us delight that in this water we are together your family. Amen. Amen.
Marjorie Ross Stewart, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the blessing of God Almighty descend upon you and dwell in your heart forever. Yes. Margie, you are now officially a member of Shandon Presbyterian Church. And this is your church family right here. They're gathered here in the sanctuary, and they are also gathered on TV and the internet. <laughs> and they are right through that little screen right there. And they can see how beautiful you are. And they have made promises on your behalf to help raise you in the faith and share the love of God with you and the stories of Jesus. And if I know anything, Margie, they are going to do good work at that. Because they sure do as Shandon Presbyterian Church. What a gift you are today. And now, on behalf of the children of Shandon Presbyterian Church, Big Sister Morgan will present a children's Bible to Margie and her family on this day of baptism. <laughs> Marjorie Ross Stewart is now speaking to the Holy Catholic Church, and through baptism, God has made her a member of the household of God. I charge you, the witnesses of this baptism, to nurture and love her, to share the good news of the gospel with her, and to help her know and follow Jesus Christ. Our scripture reading today comes from Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. First, however, let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find wisdom, and in, your, and in you we will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our reading today centers us firmly in one of the most well-known passages of all of Scripture. Even those who claim no religious affiliation or those who have never opened a Bible are still somewhat familiar with the ancient story of Adam and Eve. In fact, it's one of those stories that's so ubiquitous, it's worth looking back and seeing what exactly the Bible has to say about creation. Because like any story that's told over and over again, it can change from one telling to the next. Details can get mixed up or added, meaning and interpretation take on a life of their own. It's a little like the story of a fishing trip that my dad and my brother took together. It started innocently enough, but it ended with stormy weather and a heated argument and a damaged dock. 
Now, if you talk to my brother about what happened that day, and then you talk to my father, you will get two dramatically different stories. And then just to further confuse things, if you happen to ask them about that day while they're together, particularly if they are telling the story under the influence of late night laughter and celebration, the details begin to evolve even further as each begins to try and explain what they presume the thought process of the other was at the time. You see, memory, whether it's our memory of our own stories or our memory of our shared stories, it's not objective. It's not perfect. So when it comes to the story of creation, we should probably just stick to what the Bible tells us. Of course, before we can actually do that, there's already an issue. If we want to read what the Bible tells us about creation, we still have to make a choice because, again, there's two separate accounts. There's a story of creation in Genesis 1, and then there's another story of creation in Genesis 2. In Genesis 1, the earth and everything in it is created in six days, and God rests on the seventh. In Genesis 2, a dramatically different timeline emerges and far more attention is paid to the creation of humans who are even given names. So before we've had a chance to do any interpretation of our own, the existence of two radically different stories side by side depicting the same event suggests that the story of creation as the Bible tells it was either assembled by the sloppiest copy editors ever, or it was never intended to be read as a factual account. Now does this mean the story is true? I believe it does. I believe that things can be true even when they aren't factual because some truths are far deeper than fact. Genesis 1 tells us not that the world came into being in six or seven periods of 24 hours. Genesis 1 tells us, among other things, that God is vastly powerful and incredibly creative and able to pull up beauty and light and life out of chaos and turmoil. In Genesis 2, well, Actually, to be fair, we should first talk about what Genesis 2 doesn't tell us. The story of Adam and Eve is in Genesis 2, the story of how original sin came into the world, right? The story of two wonderfully created human beings who fall from innocence into sin because of disobedience, because of an apple and an evil snake. The only problem is that the words original, sin, fall, and apple appear nowhere in the biblical text of this story. All of those details were added later in our oral tradition as interpreters over the ages have tried to make sense of this story. What Genesis 2 actually tells us is that among other things, God places tremendous value upon relationships that God created a human to be in relationship with, and that then God created another human so that humans could be in relationship not only with God, but also with one another. From the very beginning, we're told that humans are not meant to be alone. Forgive me as I try to explain all of this with yet another story. My friends Emily and Matt, they had a baby a few months ago. Now, they agree that the baby was born on August 12th and that the baby came a bit earlier than scheduled. They agree that the baby is a girl and that the baby is named Adeline after Emily's grandmother. But if you ask Emily about the birth, she will tell you that it was so long, that it was incredibly, terribly long, 
And she will tell you that they were disappointed when it turned out that a C-section was necessary. And then she will tell you that her daughter's first cry came fast and fierce, and it was the most beautiful thing she'd ever heard. If you ask Matt about that same birth, he will tell you that everything happened frighteningly fast. And he will tell you how relieved he was when it turned out a C-section was necessary because it meant the doctors would be in a little bit more control. And he will tell you that the world stopped for at least one eternity between the moment that his daughter entered the world and the moment that she made her first sound. It's the same story. They were in the same room, and it's the same baby. Two different stories, and each one of them is absolutely 100% true. Both Emily and Matt are telling you the true story of love coming into this world. And there is more capital T truth in that story, in their stories, than facts could ever hope to offer. I believe that's the big picture of everything happening in these opening chapters of Genesis, that we are getting a true story of love creating the earth and being brought into the earth. And so I believe that in Genesis 3, it's the part of the story where that divine relational love first responds to an instance when things go off the tracks. Adam and Eve do what they are specifically told not to do. And so when they hear the sound of God walking in the garden later that evening, they hide themselves among the trees, causing God to call out, Aeka. Now that's the Hebrew, of course. Translated into English, what God calls out is, where are you? So let's clear up one thing from the get-go. God is not asking a question of geography. God is not attempting to discern which bunch of trees to look behind or which bushes to talk to. Aieka is about far more than that. A member of my church in Kansas City a remarkably kind and gentle older man. He would schedule time to stop by my office with some regularity, and every time he would settle into his chair and look me in the eyes and ask, how's your spirit? I believe that his question is the very same as the question God asks in the garden. Where are you? Where are you in your life? Where do you feel whole? Where do you feel broken? How are your relationships? How is your relationship with God? Where have you seen God recently? Are you making a difference in even one little corner of the world? Where are you? In other words, Aieka. Now, the more I read this text, the more convinced I become that God asks that question not out of anger or malice or confusion, but out of concern. Where are you? Something has changed in our relationship, God might be saying. And how is that sitting with you? You are hiding from me, God might be saying, and I never wanted there to be anything between us. Where are you? Come to me, God might be saying, so that we can sort all this out. Now there's a lot that follows this, a whole section of the story that is essentially an etiology, an explanation for why snakes slither on the ground and why women endure labor pains and, and all the rest. But don't let all of that distract you from this. God asks Adam, where are you? And Adam replies, I heard you coming, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. 
I was afraid. Because I was naked, so I hid. Now God has plenty to say about all this, but the next action that God takes is in verse 21, and this is the action. The Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. Now why? I think because nakedness is what made them afraid and fear is what caused them to hide and God does not want for us to be afraid. And God does not want for us to hide, not from God, not from ourselves, and not from the world. Ayeka, God asks, where are you? Where are you fearful, and why, and what can we do about it? I don't know how you would answer those questions. I can only tell you that I am a better person. I am a more self-aware person. I am a more faithful person when I wrestle with them regularly. There is a well-circulated story in the Jewish tradition that expands this idea even further. The story is about Rabbi Zalman, the great Hasidic master who lived in 18th century Russia. The story is about him being thrown in jail. Other Jews who opposed his practices, they told the Tsar's police that Zalman had defamed the Tsar. So, of course, this landed him in prison. He was a well-known religious leader of his day, though, so one of his jailers recognized him, and that jailer had questions about scripture. He asked the rabbi about Adam and Eve. He said, if God is all-knowledgeable, then why does God ask Adam where he is? Surely God would know that. The rabbi replied with a question of his own. Do you believe that scripture is eternal and true in every generation and to every person? He asked. The jailer said that he did. The rabbi then went on to say, then if that is true, then at all times God is asking every person, where are you? So many years and days of those allotted to you have passed. And what have you done? The rabbi continued to illustrate his point. God says something like this. You have lived for 51 years. And what have you done? Where have you stood? What good have you fostered? The story goes that the jailer, who had never met the rabbi before, was indeed 51 years old. And shaken both by this and by the rabbi's words, he broke down and wept. Where are you? Some Jewish friends of mine who have been colleagues over the years, they have helped me to understand that while some questions point us toward internal reflection, they are also always pointing us toward external action as well. That by their understanding, you cannot love God if you are not also loving your neighbor at the very same time. That you are not, that if you are not loving your neighbor, then you actually are not capable of loving God. You cannot have one without the other, my Jewish colleagues have taught me. Where are you? Where do you stand? What good have you fostered? We have a very key way of responding to this question in the coming weeks. At the risk of stating what is completely obvious, we are in the midst of a highly contentious election cycle. And it is not my place to tell you how to vote but it is my place to encourage you and implore you to vote. Casting a ballot is one of the ways we respond to the question, where are you? 
Back in 1992, the founding pastor of Village Presbyterian Church, where I once served, the founding pastor there, Dr. Bob Benili, preached these words. He said, no one can say he or she wants to do God's will on earth and not be involved in the political system. God's will is to be done in the political arena every bit as much as it is ever going to be done in the church. The American churchgoer who doesn't believe that practical politics and pious religion go together is neither religious nor patriotic. Our religion and our politics do not pull in opposite directions in a republic. They are one response, one response to a sovereign God. There is no way that we can keep the two greatest commands, love God with our whole being and love our neighbors as ourselves, unless we are personally involved in the processes that serve God's purposes and affect our neighbors' welfare. A conscientious voter and a righteous politician, he says, may be the more effective doers of God's word than any professional religionist, including ministers. Ayeka, God asks, where are you? On top of everything else today, today is Reformation Sunday, a day when we as Reformed Christians remember how Martin Luther took his 95 theses and nailed them to the door of Castle Church in Wittenberg, beginning the split between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. Now he was commanded more than once to retract his words, his writing, his position, in 1521, according to the official transcript, he responded by saying, unless I am convicted by scripture and plain reason, my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against my conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. Aika, God is asking us, where are you? And if we truly engage the question, the answers may be more powerful than we'd ever imagine possible. Pray with me. Gracious God, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
As we approach this time of prayer together, we share with you some of the joys and concerns of the Shandon community. Specifically, we remember in prayer this week, Brooks Wheeler, who's having surgery on Monday at Duke. We remember Sandy Stillinger, one of our staff members who is battling a painful infection. We remember in our prayers, Phyllis Peterson, who's recovering from a recent knee replacement surgery. We remember in our prayers Hilda Booth, who is waiting on test results, and we remember Ernest Spangler, who is on hospice care. We give thanks that jo Joey McCorkle is back at home, and we give thanks that Gary Cannon has been moved to a rehab hospital. We continue to pray for their mending and healing, but we rejoice that they have come so far already. Holding all of this in our hearts and lifting it all up to God, let us pray together. You are always with us, O oh God. From creation to the wilderness to the belly of a whale, you are with us. In the midst of a fiery furnace, in the midst of a star-struck field, you are with us. Born in a barn, enjoying a feast, in despair on the cross, even there you are with us. From our first breath until our last, you are always with us. Your son's very name declares it, Emmanuel, God with us. So gracious God, be with your people now. Remind us what incarnation looks like and feels like. Teach us anew what your kind of love can do and dare. Be with all of us, wherever we may be, whether that is on the couch or at the table or in the yard. Be with those who are on the streets of Richland County and in the heart of Columbia. Be with those who are still snuggled under warm blankets. Be with those who are waiting anxiously, counting pennies and crossing fingers in line at the supermarket. Be with those who are enduring treatment, watching chemo deposit hope one drop at a time into their veins. Be with those who are dreaming, dreaming of making new friends, of finding a job, of finding their way in this world, of solving this world's problems. Be with those who are crushed under grief, O oh God, lamenting the loss of a future they once counted on. And be with those who are no longer crushed by it, but who are daily reminded of it, for the road grief travels is long and broad. Be with those who are haunted by the violence of a gun, the longevity of a war, the inequality of education, the displacement of children, the, re the relentlessness of loneliness, and the pervasiveness of a virus. O oh God, be with all those who greeted this morning with dread, and be with all those who greeted this morning with a dance. Be the incarnated one we have grown to know and trust, the one who stops at nothing to love us through everything. The one who brings heaven and earth a bit closer each and every day. Your presence is our prayer, O oh God. Showing up and saving your people is what you do. So be present now and help us to be present too, everywhere your love is so desperately needed. Remake our hearts so that they beat with your priorities. Give us wisdom to discern what is urgent and what is important, and what can wait. Give us strength and determination as we shape our days, weeping with those who weep and laughing with those who laugh. Give us the courage to synchronize our calendars and our clocks with your kingdom. Give us the gentleness to bind up the brokenhearted. Give us the grace to become the people you have always intended for us to be. Trusting in your ability to do all of this and even more, we pray the way your Son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory, now and forever. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Let us now return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth, a bountiful harvest from that first garden to all we are blessed with now. For heaven and earth are yours, O God, and of your own we give to you. For God, you are the maker of all things, and through your goodness and grace and love, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, our possessions. Use us, utilize us, and what we have gathered together in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, this day. Friends, wherever you go and whatever you do this day and in the days to come, remember this. It was love that gathered you into this time and space this morning, and it is the same love of God that now sends you out into a world that is absolutely beautiful and yet still broken, which means it is a world that is desperately and deeply in need of your skills and your gifts and your compassion. The world needs you and what you alone have to offer. So do your best to show up with it every day and trust that God's grace will carry you the rest of the way. But as you go, may joy and nothing less follow you all the days of your life. May you be blessed and may you be a blessing and may you rest well today, secure in the knowledge that the Lord of light who has brought you this far already will lead you and countless others all the way home. Amen.